Okay, all right, and we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome virtually to all of you. Welcome to the 14th co opting AI event, the second fully remote, entirely quarantine compliant uh, event today on the European General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. I'm particularly excited about this one. I've been meaning to do this for a long time. I'm very excited to welcome Sandra and Ira, and, and thank you for tuning in. <clears throat> My name is Dr. Mona Stone. I am a sociologist at New York University. Uh, I work on inequality in the context of AI design and policy. I am a fellow at the NYU Institute for Public Knowledge. I work with the GovLab as well as with NYU's New Alliance for Public Interest Technology. I'm also an adjunct professor at NYU Penn School for Engineering. Um, and I have the honor of being an inaugural fellow with um, the Tisch School of the Arts with the Future of Imagination Collaboratory. Um, at IPK, I have founded and I convened the Co-opting AI series, and I also curate the technology section with public books. Um, before I say a few words about today's event and introduce our wonderful panelists, I want to acknowledge that I, and assume a few of you as well, am gathered on the unceded land of the Lanapi peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. NYU also acknowledges that it was founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those on whose land NYU is located. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Now, back to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence or AI really has captivated our imagination over and over again. The idea of intelligent machines actually can be said to date back to Homer's Iliad. Now, over the past decade and a half, the vastly improved computing capacity and the increasingly routine harvesting of large sets of data in the context of what Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism or the trading of behavioral futures really has seen AI resurface as a crucial ingredient for a prosperous future. Often hailed as the gateway to the fourth industrial revolution, AI technologies are increasingly deployed across many parts of society. They are embedded into loan decisions, insurance policy decisions, government services, spam folder and autocorrect software, education, search engine and web recommendations, autonomous driving, navigation, medicine, policing, security, immigration enforcement, the military, supply chain management, production, and so many more. And with that, very often comes a pervasive form of technological determinism. We see that very clearly in the context of the current pandemic. Technological interventions such as contact tracing applications are often treated as the gateway to tackling the spread of the virus. And we'll be talking about that later today. But that does not sit well with the fact that technological solutions to social problems rarely or ever really work without the integration into policy decisions. Um, so the point really is that with all the noise around the technological aspect of artificial intelligence, we are increasingly distracted from asking what is really at stake in our society, in our economy, in our public health system. We get sidetracked as we move forward into a new socio-technological future. And I think really it is at this point that AI actually comes in handy. AI prompts us to reevaluate these big questions, questions about power, democracy, inequality, and what it means to be human. And the Co-Opting AI series set out to take that prompt seriously. Um, the series co-opts the AI discourse to keep asking these bigger questions and ask them not just from an economical or technological point of view, but include diverse social, political, and historical perspectives. And the goal is to do that without going down either the rabbit hole of techno-solutionism or the rabbit hole of techno-skepticism. Now, this series would not be possible without the generous and always fantastic sponsorship of the IPK, the Institute for Public Knowledge, as well as the 370J Project and NYU's Department of 
Technology Culture and Society. And I'm very pleased to say that today's event is also co-sponsored by the NYU Information Law Institute and NY Law Gorwini Global Law and Tech. Thank you for that. Um, now to the GDPR, since it came into force in May 2019, the European GDPR framework has often been hailed as a hallmark, hallmark regulatory framework for data privacy regulation on this side of the Atlantic. However, the increasing proliferation of AI technologies and the often invasive data collection practices that underpin artificial intelligence sort of have routinely put the GDPR to a test. And then COVID-19 has created a whole new situation that may require extensive contact tracing, which could include forms of data collection that the GDPR actually sets out to regulate. And today we will focus on that tension, the tension between the GDPR and data privacy and regulation and artificial intelligence. And we will also be talking about uh, the new challenges in the context of the pandemic. I have the honor of being joined by two leading experts from Europe and the US uh, in the field, Sandra Wachter and Ira Rubenstein, to critically discuss both the strengths and weaknesses of the GDPR and ponder questions such as, how does the GDPR relate to newly emerging concerns arising in the context of artificial intelligence? And what kind of data privacy policy conversations are likely to follow the pandemic? Now, without further ado, please let me introduce the wonderful speakers tonight. Starting the conversation will be Ira Rubenstein, who is a senior fellow at the Information Law Institute of NYU's School of Law, and also a senior fellow at the Future of Privacy Forum. Ira's research interests include internet privacy, electronic surveillance law, voters' privacy, local privacy regulation, EU data protection law, and privacy engineering. Ira lectures and publishes widely on issues of privacy and security and has testified before Congress on these topics on numerous occasions. Before coming to NYU in 2008, Ira spent 17 years in Microsoft's legal and corporate affairs department most recently as Associate General Counsel in charge of the Regulatory Affairs and Public Policy Group. Prior to joining Microsoft, he was in private practice in Seattle, specializing in immigration law. Ira graduated from Yale Law School in 1985, and he has served on the President's Export Council Subcommittee on Encryption, the editorial board of the IEEE Security and Privacy Magazine, the board of directors of the Center for Democracy and Technology, as Rapporteur EU-US Privacy Bridges Project, which was presented at the 2015 International Conference of Privacy and Data Protection Commissioners in Amsterdam, and on the organizing committee of the Privacy by Design Workshops at the Computing Research Association. Following Iris remarks will be Sandra Wachter, who is an Associate Professor and Senior Research Fellow in Law and Ethics on AI, Big Data, Robotics, and Internet Regulation at the Oxford Internet Institute at the University of Oxford. She's a visiting professor at Harvard Law School where she works on her current British Academy project, AI and the right to reasonable algorithmic inferences. And you'll be hearing about that today. Aiming to find mechanisms that provide greater protection to the right to privacy and identity and against algorithmic discrimination. Sandra is also a fellow at the Alan Turing Institute in London a fellow of the World Economic Forum's Global Futures Council on Values, Ethics, and Innovation, a member of the European Commission's Expert Group on, group on Autonomous Cars, and an academic affiliate at the Bonavera Institute of Human Rights at Oxford's Law Faculty, and a member of the Law Committee of the IEEE. Previous, previously, Sandra worked at the Royal Academy of Engineering and the Austrian Ministry of Health. Sandra specializes in technology, IP, and data protection law, as well as European, international, human rights, and medical law. Her current research focuses on the legal and ethical implications of AI, big data, and robotics, as well as profiling, inferential analytics, explainable AI, algorithmic bias, governmental surveillance, predictive policing, and human rights online. Sandra works on the governance and ethical design of algorithms, including the development of standards to open up the AI black box and to enhance algorithmic ac accountability, transparency, and explainability. Sandra also works on ethical auditing methods for AI to combat bias and discrimination, 
and to ensure fairness and diversity with a focus on non-discrimination law and group privacy. Group privacy, autonomy, and identity protection and profiling and branch analytics are also on her research agenda. A wonderful combination of uh, academic and applied work. Very, uh, very warm well welcome to both of our panelists. A few words on housekeeping. We will be hearing from Ira for 10 to 20 minutes, then from Sandra. Um, meanwhile, people who are watching, you can pose questions for the Q&A, which will be following the presentations and the panel discussions through Twitter, through the IPK Twitter account, which is NYU underscore IPK. Um, we will, I'm pleased to say that we do have closed captioning and I'm also pleased to say that as per usual, uh, the recording of this session will be made available through the IPK YouTube channel. Now, without further ado, Ira, over to you. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, Sandra, uh, joining us actually from Oxford and Ira uh, joining us from the West Coast. So a truly um, a, a very international global panel uh, tonight. Over to Ira, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Moda, and welcome everyone who's joined us online. I'm going to begin with just some brief remarks on the strengths and weaknesses of the GDPR. Um, and to start with, let me point out that it's importantly a rights-based uh, privacy regulation, which means that it always looks to fundamental rights and this provides, um, compared to the US, I'd say much uh, greater uh, resistance against commercial pressures because there's always an underlying basis in, in human rights in uh, evaluating uh, commercial services. Um, it's a comprehensive law. It's often called an omnibus law as opposed to the sectoral approach taken in the US. It also applies not only to private firms, but also to government agencies, unlike much uh, US law, which tends to be uh, consumer-based and only apply to a limited extent to government agencies. It's quite robust in the sense that it has uh, principles based on all the usual fair information practices of notice, consent, access, and so on. But importantly, it also requires that data, protect, data processing be lawful and fair. And this requirement of lawful and, and fair processing is really uh, the heart of the, of the GDPR. Um, one of the promises of the GDPR is compared to the prior law, the Data Protection Directive, which was first enacted in 1995, um, is precisely that it's a regulation. So the directive in European law means that it was a requirement that member states of the EU enact national laws consistent with the requirements of the directive, whereas the GDPR is a regulation, as soon as it took effect, applied uh, immediately. Now that's not to say that there aren't national laws implementing it as well, but the general idea was that as a regulation, it would be more consistent. It would kind of solve some of the harmonization issues that arose under the directive. This may be more of a promise than a reality, but that remains to be seen. <clears throat> the GDPR is also, um, greatly strengthened in terms of enforcement compared to the earlier directive. Um, the, the private sector was, was you know, quite uh, struck by the size of penalties that would be available under the GDPR, up to two to four percent of annual revenues, which for some of the larger US companies could mean fines in the billions of dollars, like antitrust fines. And this greatly elevated data protection as a issue uh, that uh, CEOs uh, had to pay attention to just as they do antitrust or mergers or uh, corrupt practices and so on. Um, this is one area where US law I think is equally strong, um, but another important aspect of the GDPR is just its worldwide uh, influence. Some people call this the Brussels effect. I think it's partly due as well to the fact that Interestingly, and unlike US law, the GDPR and the directive before it both included an adequacy requirement, which means that transfers of data from Europe to other countries could only take place if the laws of those other countries were deemed adequate by the European Commission. 
And that meant that a lot of other countries both uh, sought to ensure that their laws satisfied this requirement so they could freely engage in data flows with Europe, um, or if they didn't yet have a data protection law, they modeled it on the EU law. Um, the other thing I'd point out that's really noteworthy here is that even though from start to finish, if you count like the first time the commission began to talk about reforming the directive, it took nine years uh, for the GDPR to come into force. That's a long time, but it was, it was completed, it was successful. Uh, Congress has been contemplating comprehensive privacy legislation in the US for 20 years and, and has yet to enact a comprehensive law. Um, so these are some of the strengths, but I'm really gonna focus a little bit more on, on the weaknesses. I think there's maybe a bit of a tendency to idealize the GDPR, uh, to see it as if it were not the outcome of political compromises, just like any law enacted in, in any other part of the world, including the US. But in fact, I think there are some shortcomings. Uh, and I'll begin by noting several uh, or in particular three fallacies that a uh, professor at Tilburg, Bert uh, Koop, uh, first pointed out a few years ago. The first fallacy is what he calls the control fallacy. This is not quite as prominent in the GDPR as in US law, but it's been the basic idea that individuals can somehow manage their own uh, privacy by familiarizing themselves with policies and practices and making wise choices. The US privacy law tends to be almost uh, exclusively based on this idea of notice and choice. While this isn't true of the GDPR, it's still, consent is still a fairly prominent element of the GDPR. Another fallacy is the claim that the GDPR somehow simplifies data protection law. Uh, to the contrary, I would argue that it made it more complex. Um, it weighs in at 88 pages, it has 173 recitals, it has 99 articles, all of which are highly interdependent uh, and somewhat vague and lacking in clarity and difficult to interpret. Um, so any quest for simplicity, I'd say, was, was more or less a failure. Uh, thirdly, the law um, attempts to be comprehensive. This can be a strength, but it also arguably stretches data protection law to the breaking point. I think this has a couple of different meanings. One is that in attempting to give universal application to core principles um, like data minimization, uh, the law often just, just fails. We, we don't see less data being collected. So, and so in that sense, uh, the, the, the law sets itself tasks that it may not be able to accomplish. Um, there's also the problem of the ever expanding scope of personal data, uh, particularly in the era of big data and artificial intelligence where arguably all data becomes personal data because you can infer from, um, you know, non-personal and non-sensitive data, a great many uh, personal facts about individuals, at which point the GDPR becomes the law of all laws, the regulation of all data, uh, uh, which is maybe just too ambitious for it. I'd add a couple of additional points to this. One is that in terms of uh, complexity, I also see the GDPR as what I would call a, a belt and suspenders law. So it's not sufficient that it state general principles, um, that it articulate uh, rights that uh, data subjects hold. It also emphasizes accountability. Now this is a good thing, but it doesn't rely on one or two or three means for achieving accountability. It relies on every possible means. Data protection by design and default, data protection impact assessments, appointment of data protection officers, certification of products and services, and so on and so forth. This, I think, reflects a certain distrust of big data and of the firms engaged in big data and AI practices that, that may, in fact, uh, prove uh, uh, unfortunate in the long term. So that's one additional problem. Another is in terms of enforcement, uh, yes, there are much stiffer penalties available, but there's a real scale problem here. Does, does 
do the European countries have sufficient resources to really enforce this law seriously? Are they going to have uh, enough personnel to review data protection impact assessments and certifications? Are they going to use penalties wisely? Let me turn now to a, a third set of problems that will form a uh, transition to Sandra's remarks. Um, and this has to do with whether some of the core principles are in effect being overwhelmed by big data and, and AI. Uh, this is something I talked about in a paper in 2013, but that uh, Tal Zarsky, a, a Haifa law professor has recently written about in an article called Incompatible GDPR in the Age of Big Data. And he identifies four incompatibilities. Uh, the first is purpose limitation. In big data, you often don't know in advance what the purpose of the data collection or analysis is. So if you have to strictly adhere to a purpose limitation requirement, that could seriously undermine uh, the big data enterprise. The second is data minimization, which you know just by its very terms um, is highly inconsistent with the thrust of big data and AI, which is to collect as much data as possible for potentially beneficial uses. The third is what in technical terms in the GDPR is called special categories or sensitive data, data about <clears throat> political beliefs, sexual orientation, religion, et cetera. Um, additional requirements are imposed on the collection and analysis of special categories of data, but it's not clear if this distinction is still viable. As I suggested before, if you can derive sensitive data from ordinary data, it, it becomes more and more difficult to maintain this distinction. And finally, there's the question of what's called automated decisions. So this is a provision known as Article 22 that amounts to a right not to be subjected to automated decisions that substantially impact individuals. There are some exceptions to it, but it boils down to a right to uh, intervene in these automated decision-making processes or to obtain uh, access to the information or the logic underlying them. Um, and there are there's specific language in the GDPR that talks about uh, requiring notice of the existence of such uh, automatic decision-making processes, as well as the logic underlying them. And I think there are a couple of problems with this and Zarsky points this out in his article as well. One is that this requirement may run into trade secrets and other IP protection laws, making it difficult for companies to uh, reveal information that satisfies that requirement. Um, another is that uh, this basically is requiring controllers that conduct a big data analysis um, to do so in a way that assures that whatever the results are, the outcomes of the analysis are explainable or interpretable. And that simply may not be feasible. That may not be the way the systems are designed, or it may necessitate sacrificing a certain amount of precision, precision or even insight uh, in order to satisfy that requirement. Um, finally, there's also a, uh, a right to seek human intervention in automated decisions, but this might be you know, negligible. It could just be like, get somebody to look at it after the fact, which is kind of meaningless or it could be quite burdensome if it somehow requires that in addition to the algorithmic processes, you also have uh, some kind of you know, human calculation of, of how the decision is reached. So Sandra is someone who's written extensively about Article 22, about algorithmic fairness and the ethics of big data and AI generally. And in 2017, she co-authored an article that really called into doubt uh, the existence of this right of exp to explanation and its technical feasibility. There was a rebuttal published at that time by two of my colleagues at the Information Law Institute, Andrew Selps and Julia Powells, and you know the, the battle was joined, so to speak. And these articles have been extremely influential in fostering a ongoing conversation regarding the benefits, the technological feasibility, and the social trade-offs uh, required uh, in achieving algorithmic accountability, whether by a right to explanation or otherwise. So before I turn it over to Sandra, I just wanna make two uh, additional points. The first, 
The first is that the, the articles I referred to a moment ago were published in 2017, just on the eve of the GDPR taking effect. Um, and that was two years ago. So what's changed in the interim? Well, to begin with the um, Article 29 Working Party, which is the uh, advisory group consisting of national uh, data protection officials in Europe who meet on a regular basis uh, to go over issues and produce uh, opinions on a variety of topics. They've issued guidelines on automated decision-making, uh, which were endorsed by a more recent advisory group called the European Data Protection Board, um, as have several um, national uh, authorities, including in the UK, the uh, Information Commissioner's Office. So one thing that I'd be curious about Sandra addressing is whether these guidelines have, have clarified any of the underlying issues and have they more importantly resulted in any changes in how organizations are designing, testing, deploying uh, their automated decision-making systems, their AI uh, systems. Um, I would note here that these guidelines, I uh, haven't looked at them that closely, but they do reflect at least one of the shortcomings I mentioned a moment ago, and that's the overall complexity of the GDPR. If you look at the guidelines, they identify no fewer than nine principles uh, that reference profiling and automated decision generally, and nine principles that specifically interact with Article 22. So that, that, that's a pretty complex approach. That said, um, there has been an argument uh, made recently in an article by several uh, US privacy scholars in the Berkeley Technology Law Journal to the effect that the guidelines will achieve something important insofar as they emphasize uh, data protection impact assessments that occur upfront. So rather than trying to rely on individuals seeking a remedy after the fact, the data protection impact assessments would allow uh, controllers who are using and putting forward these uh, automated decision systems to uh, take account of various problems around fairness and bias um, and to try to uh, assess those up front and mitigate them before actually releasing the systems, rather than instead relying on human intervention after the fact. Um, so with, uh, with, with that, I think I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Sandra um, and uh, see what she has to say. Thank you so much. I have um, some slides to share with you. Um, I will try that now. Fingers crossed that this works out. Has that worked? Should be fine. Fantastic. Um, yes, hello, um, everyone. Wonderful. Um, yeah, to see you all virtually. Thank you so much for, for tuning in. Um, very excited to be here and to have the opportunity to talk to you about some of my more recent work on um, algorithm decision making and privacy and non discrimination. So, therefore, the title of my talk Privacy on Discrimination in Algorithm World. Um, so, yeah, as Ira uh, mentioned, I have been doing um, quite some extensive work on the question of explainability and how we can open up the, the black box, how we can make those systems more um, explainable um, yeah, to increase algorithmic accountability, which is desperately needed um, in those times. And following um, the uh, article that um, Ira just mentioned, I published a paper together with two of my colleagues, Brent Middleson and Chris Russell, on counterfactual explanations um, basically moving away from the legal argument to try to figure out what we actually mean when we talk about explanations and what would a good explanation actually looks like, look like, how is it possible to implement it from a technical perspective, how can we make things explainable, understandable without infringing trade secrets and intellectual property rights. 
So that's the paper um, on that. I'm not going to have time to, to talk about that, but if anybody wants to have a look at that, um, it's, it's publicly available. And many companies, for example, um, Google, have implemented our idea now. So that's a massive um, step forward in terms of um, making systems more accountable and transparent. However, this is not where the work ends. Um, because I think, even though I'm a huge fan of explanations, and I think they are pivotal and very important, um, they are not the end of the story. They are just one little puzzle in the big picture of accountability, because explanations do not equal justifications. I can be very transparent um, and very open about how I make decisions and how I assess you. That doesn't mean that what I'm doing is actually justified. I can tell you to your face that you're not getting the job because I don't like your face. That's explainable, that's very clear, but it's probably not justified. So after doing a lot of work on the, let's say exposed um, component of um, like accountability, explaining the decision that has been made, I got interested in the question, what actually happens before a decision has been made? And is the way that we make decisions actually justified? And speaking of, I don't like your face, and this is why I'm not hiring you, even though that sounds very odd, it might be actually something that happens in the future. So an interesting article from a couple of months back that showed that um, employers in the UK are using facial recognition um, for job interviews. So basically inferring something about you to make decisions, as in, yes, you are gonna get the job. So there is, you know, um, a lot of privacy invasiveness and potential discrimination um, problematic that arrives from that. Again, speaking of faces, um, looking, for example, at uh, China, where facial recognition software is being used to infer your credit worthiness. Um, so that's, you know, a, a new trend that um, increases the problem of, of the um, of human rights. And the last one is here. Um, insurance companies that are using non-traditional data to infer if somebody should be granted insurance and what premiums they should get. So they are looking not at your personal data, they are actually looking at your friends. They are looking at your friends on Facebook and the people that you around, surround yourself with, and they infer if you are somebody that is worthy of insurance. So that means it's not just about explaining what's happening, it's about the inferences, the predictions, the opinions that are being made about you, right? It could be me, that could mean in banking, as I said, you're a high risk um, group and you're therefore not a reliable borrower. It's health insurance, very important topic here. You infer that somebody might get um, COVID in the future and that impacts whether or not you get insurance. Um, employment, somebody might not get uh, promoted or get fired because algorithms are assessing them, inferring something about them, are predicting something about them, um, and that has a massive impact on, on their lives. And obviously, with inferences and opinions and predictions, the problem is they are not necessarily facts. At the time when you make the decision about a person, you don't know if you're actually right about that because the event is going to happen in the future. It might or it might not, but at the moment where you make the decision, it's not quite clear if you're right about this. And that prompted me to actually think about this from a legal perspective and ask myself, well, this is quite scary, or it can be quite scary. Let's think about whether or not we already have enough protections that guard, guard us against the novel risk of interventionalytics. And as Mona um, mentioned, that is my current research project. And this is the paper that is the counterstone um, of that whole research project, which is called the Right to Reasonable Inferences, Rethinking Data Protection Law in the Age of Big Data and AI. Again, co-authored with um, one of my um, colleagues from the OII. Um, and what we were interested in was the question of whether or not and to what extent those inferences actually receive sufficient protection on the GDPR. Because um, the question that we were asking ourselves is if inferences, you know, the way you're being assessed, um, your credit worthiness, whether you should get promoted or hired, um, whether you're a high risk group, if those inferences and those opinions are personal data, then it would open up the possibility of having a lot of um, rights in GDPR that would protect you. 
um, you would have, for example, the right of access. You could go to any data controller. That could be a private company. It could be the public sector and ask them, what do you think about me? What are you inferring about me? And please give me a copy of that information. So you would have the right to know what has been inferred during the job interview when the facial recognition software was used or was what inferred from your face when you were applying for a loan. If inferences are personal data, you would have a right to access them. The second thing that is might, might be interesting is that um, if inferences are personal data, you would also have the right to rectification, which you usually have for all personal data. So you can go again to a data controller and say, the information that you're holding about me is inaccurate or incomplete. I wish to rectify that. A very powerful tool, especially when we talk about inferences and predictions and assessment of people. So um, the paper that I just introduced has, I think, uh, 150 or 60 pages with around 600 footnotes um, trying to answer the question whether or not inferences are personal data. And to this date, I can tell you two things. I don't know, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> that is the, um, the finding of, of the paper. We looked at... Um, legal doctrine, we look, looked at the case law, we look at all around and it's not very clear if inferences are personal data. Most importantly, we looked at the court of justice and what the court of justice thinks, uh, what constitutes personal data. And the court is unclear. There is one judgment that says inferences are personal data. There is one judgment sa that says it isn't. However, and this is why I'm saying it doesn't really matter, is there are three different judgments that all say that just because something is personal data doesn't mean you get all the rights attached to it. So that doesn't mean that you automatically get the right of access. It doesn't mean that you automatically get the right of rectification. And in three different judgments, the court said that data protection law does not actually have the purpose to regulate the content of decision making. So what you're assessing and how you're assessing people is not something that the law is actually concerned with. The law is concerned with what we call procedural privacy, like things that Ira mentioned. We are interested in consent. We are interested in transparency. We're interested in having a data protection officer, procedural rights that you have. You don't necessarily have a recourse. In most cases, you won't have a recourse over how you're being assessed according to GDPR. You might have a shot fighting how you're being assessed if there is a sectorial law that allows you to do so, but GDPR will not give you a right to contest how you're being assessed. And in many cases, that is fine. Um, in others, it might not be okay because we are lacking sectorial ro uh, rules that govern how we assess people. And this is the reason, um, what this, the reason is because we have private autonomy in decision-making, right? We leave it to decision makers in the private industry, as well as the public sector, um, leave it up to them how they make decisions, how they assess people, who they hire and who they give insurance to. Obviously, um, they are confined by some laws like non-discrimination law, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But in general, you don't have a right to get a job or insurance or loan or go to university. And there are very little decision making standards that bind um, uh, that then find the private sector. And if you're starting to use such privacy invasive data like facial recognition or your friends on Facebook or very unintuitive um, data that you leave behind, then it could actually be a problem that you have no recourse. So this is another um, puzzle, very fitting to what Ira has said, where I think the GDPR is on the one hand fantastic that we have it, but there is some more work to be done. And this is definitely an area. Shifting gears a little bit and moving away from, from GDPR and looking at fairness and AI. Like the examples that I mentioned, you could immediately guess that this not only has privacy implications, it also has problems that have to do with fairness and potential discrimination. And here I want to quickly talk about two papers um, that are recently published that are looking at both GDPR as well as European non-discrimination law. The first is called Why Fairness Cannot Be Automated. I'm bridging the gap between EO non-discrimination and AI, again, with one of my colleagues um, from the OII, Brent Middlestead, an ethicist, and um, Chris Russell, computer scientist. And what we did is we analyzed European um, non-discrimination law and tried to figure out what the court thinks fairness means 
and map that and compare that to the fairness definitions that are being developed in the tech community, because there's a very interesting discussion of what fairness actually means, a very interesting academic discussion, and we were looking at the question, what does the legal definition of fairness look like? The second paper that I want to quickly talk about is on um, discrimination um, protection in when it comes to online advertisements. Both of those papers are publicly available. Um, I'm just going to briefly mention a couple of things there. Um, yeah, if, if you want to dive deeper into those, um, I, I would love to hear your comments on that. So just very, very quickly, um, so we're all on the same page, the very little, uh, the, the basics on European non discrimination law. Roughly, we have two types of discrimination that we want to prevent. We have direct and indirect discrimination. Direct discrimination, as the, as the name says, is I'm using a protected attribute and I'm using it to treat you less favorably. I'm telling you you're not getting the job uh, because you're a woman. That will be illegal in most circumstances. More tricky is the idea of indirect discrimination. That means you're using a seemingly neutral provision criteria in your practice. You apply that to everybody. Um, it has nothing to do with the protected attribute, but it just so happens that it does disadvantage a certain group more than others that are in a similar, in a similar situation. So uh, example would be if I had a height requirement for hiring people saying, I'm only gonna hire people that are taller than two meters, as very tall people, um, Height has nothing to do with gender. Um, it, it, height is not a protected attribute, but you will know that if you have height requirement, it will particularly disadvantage women or is likely to disadvantage women because on average we are shorter. So that's the difference between uh, direct and indirect discrimination. So great protections, fantastic that we have them. Now with algorithms as discriminators and not humans, I see a great danger that our current laws might not be up to the task. Because algorithms are very different in the way that they discriminate against us than humans are. Because traditional, um, when compared with them, they are more abstract, they're less intuitive, uh, the discrimination is less intuitive, it's subtle, it's intangible, and it's very difficult um, to detect. And that causes challenges for the tools that we have to develop to combat discrimination. So the legal tools that we have to investigate, to prevent and punish discrimination, always have a human perpetrator in mind and not um, AI. So two things that come into place um, that, that are being challenged is the way how claimants raise um, lawsuits and the way how they can access evidence. Most importantly, when you start, when you compare a hostile work environment, for example, when you assess a hostile work environment, what happens? Somebody tells you to your face, you're not getting the job because you're a woman. Or they're creating a hostile work environment where you feel harassed and then you bring up a claim or people are getting promoted over your head, for example. Point is, you feel that something is off. You feel discriminated. You feel treated unfairly. You bring a claim. That is completely eroded um, when we talk about algorithms as discriminators. Um, for example, if I didn't want you to see my job advertisement, it, and traditionally it would be quite hard to make you not see it. I could do like that thing, I could cut it out and make sure you don't see it. Or I could make sure that I'm only selling papers in an area where a certain population um, does not exist, for example. Um, or I write a job advertisement that is so unattractive that you would never apply. But again, you might find that out and you might actually bring a claim. Now what's happening is that algorithms are assessing us before we even see the job advertisements. So they're inferring all types of stuff about us. They can infer very sensitive detail, um, ranging from sexual orientation, um, political opinions, health status, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, everything. And they do that without you knowing. So while you're looking for a job, what they're doing is they're filtering you out. And the only thing that you see is this, no jobs found but you don't know what you're missing out on because you're losing that comparative element, that feeling of being discriminated against is being eroded. 
but it's not just for job advertisement. It's basically for anything that is offered online. We have to remember that everything that we see online is being curated for us. It's being tailored to us. Um, it's specifically, you know, one version of the truth, but not the whole version. So that means it's the search results on Google. It's the tweets that you see on Twitter. It's the posts on Facebook. And it's the prices that you see on Amazon, for example. Traditionally, you would go to a supermarket. And if you're lucky enough and you still have toilet paper, you could go and compare the prices and compare it and take the thing that you have yeah, the best price um, for value. In the online world, you don't necessarily have that anymore. You see one price, but you don't actually know if the price that you're being offered is being better or worse than other people's price. So that again, the potential feeling of losing out of being treated unfairly is being eroded. So in reality, what happens is you look like this. You have blinders and you don't really see um, what's happening around you and that you're being filtered out and assessed all the time. And that is necessary because if you don't feel discriminated against, you won't bring a claim. And therefore I think it's problematic um, with non-discrimination law in the future. The second thing has to do with lack of evidence. Let's just say you actually figure out that you have been discriminated against and that you have been filtered out. Um, how are you going to prove this? That has always been a problem, of course, but it is getting harder and harder. Let's just go back to the example of indirect discrimination. Again, you have a neutral provision that applies to everybody, but it just so happens that it affects a certain group more than others. Um, the way that we have done this in the past and which judges have done this in the past is that we often rely on intuition and we rely on common knowledge and obvious facts and convictions. And why? Because, you know, the cases before the Court of Justice or any court in the European Union, they um, are based on real life cases. They are based on actual social inequalities where it's immediately apparent that there is something wrong. It's obvious um, without having the data. Let me give you a couple of examples. If I told you um, I'm banning headscarves in the workplace, you would immediately know that there might be a problem with freedom of religion. You don't need numbers to know that. If I told you I'm only giving social benefits to married couples, you will immediately know that this could be discriminatory based on sexual orientation. If I told you I'm only hiring people that have long hair, you will immediately know that this could, an impact, could have an impact on gender. So I immediately understand that the, the social reality of that data, the intuitive connection between this, the thing that you're using to assess somebody and the potential inequality is immediately apparent. Now with all the examples that I showed you, um, at the beginning of the talk, it's much, much harder to see that because what does your sh food shopping habits say about you, right? How does that correlate with protected attributes? Does it correlate with protected attributes? Where's the evidence? How does your viewing habits, what you watch on Netflix during quarantine, reflect on you as a person? Um, how does it correlate with protected attributes? Does it? Where is the data? The things that you consume online, how they relate to you, unclear. Do you have any evidence to show that this, this, affect, this affects a protected group more than others? Hard to find out, very hard to get access to. So. I want to um, yeah, close on a more positive note because I also thought about possible um, solution in that. Um, and I think we need to think about privacy protection and non-discrimination as somewhat related, maybe sister disciplines that are getting more and more closer the more we use algorithms. I think it's, as I said, very important that we think about new privacy protections that are better than what we currently have in GDPR. I think we should have a right to reasonable inferences. And that means we should have a right that um, high risk inferences are justified on a sectoral basis. I think it's good that we have GDPR, but we need more protection, especially when it comes to inferences that are very privacy invasive, that are reputational damaging, um, and that are being used for very important decisions. And when we do that, what I want to do, again, something that Ira already mentioned is move away from consent. Nobody has time to read the terms and conditions. Um, it's not an effective tool to govern, um, to govern privacy preferences. I want to shift the burden over to those who actually collect the data. Um, I want them to show me 
that the data that they're using is relevant and normatively acceptable, that the inferences and the data sources are relevant and normatively acceptable. That means we have to ask ourselves the question, is it normatively acceptable to use facial recognition for job applications or for loan applications? Um, is that something that we want in our society? Is that type of inference that we can draw on the data source, is that something that we want? Second question, is it reliable? The question of can I use or should I use my friends on Facebook to make um, insurance decisions about people? Is there actually statistical um, reliable data that shows that this is a good predictor for defaulting the loan? And that's the ex ante component. And then moving on to the exposed idea of maybe contesting and maybe get an explanation um, for so-called un unreasonable inferences. And the last one, very quickly on the reliability side, because reliability also relates to um, bias and fairness. And in the paper that I mentioned, um, uh, the uh, why finance cannot be automated, we try to figure out how you can test for that type of bias. And the thing that we try to do is, as I said, we try to figure out how we can, um, yeah, <laughs> get what the court wants and what the court thinks is fair somehow translated on a technical component. Again, I don't have much time to talk about this, but we found out that um, conditional demographic parity, disparity is a good statistical measure to start approaching what the court actually thinks is fair. Um, what it will do is it will not tell you whether something is illegal or whether something can be justified. It's more like a treasure map that shows you where potential dangers lie. It tells you where to look, but it doesn't tell you where to think because intuition will be less important in the future. As I said, we don't necessarily deal with data that have to do with long hair or bands of headscarves. We're gonna um, have untraditional data sources where the immediate danger is not um, clear and therefore we need actual testing that shows us whether or not this untraditional data sources pose a risk to groups. And that would be a first step um, that would be helping um, regulators, it would help judges, it would help um, people who want to bring a claim, and it would also help industry because they could start preemptively um, testing for bias. So I want to close with, with the idea that I think a holistic approach is the best way forward. Uh, in general, when it comes to AI, but especially in the face of, of the current crisis, I think a right to reasonable inferences can increase the current data protection standards that we have. Um, I think things need to be explained to us and we have to make sure that um, the tools that we are using are properly um, tested for bias. And if we have those three things together, I think we can do amazing things with AI without infringing on fundamental and human rights. Thank you. Thank you so much to Ira and Sandra for this fantastic um, overview and the fantastic analysis of the GDPR and the context of artificial intelligence. I want to quickly remind our viewers that we uh, do take questions for the Q&A part of this event through Twitter, through NYU underscore IPK. Um, and we now have this wonderful sort of uh, toolbox that was given to us by Ira. Um, and Sandra, and we have a very um, pressing uh, situation in terms of data collect inv potentially invasive data collection practices uh, in the context of um, addressing the pandemic, managing the spread of the virus. And so we're going to keep collecting questions on the GDPR and the, um, uh, the presentations that both Ira and Sandra gave. Um, and we'll ask these questions in the queue in a um, section, but I want to turn back over to Ira and sort of ask what, uh, what kinds of new challenges are we facing in the context of uh, uh, COVID-19 um, and things like contact tracing? Um, and what, what is sort of what kinds of tools do we have at our disposal to uh, work with those? Uh, thank you, Mona. Um, let me just uh, talk a little bit generally about different approaches to contact tracing, and then focus in on what's happening in, in Europe and how this challenges the GDPR. So I've been reading pretty extensively on uh, efforts underway around the world in China, South Korea, Israel, Singapore, the US, et cetera. 
And it seems to me that there are three basic approaches that are being taken. The first and probably the most privacy protective is uh, phone-based uh, Bluetooth apps to determine the proximity of users where the phones broadcast and, and record uh, anonymized IDs of nearby devices. And then if somebody is infected, you can go back and see if that infected person's device was in contact, uh, in sufficiently close contact with, with another device. Now, one of the big issues around this approach is whether it's voluntary or mandatory. If it's voluntary, research has suggested that at least 50 or even 60% of the population would have to use it in order for it to be effective. In other words, in order for it to provide sufficient information uh, to map infection routes and, and provide warnings and maybe even engage in some kind of quarantine enforcement. Um, it could be mandatory, uh, at least in the US, state and federal authorities have emergency authority, perhaps to make it mandatory. I'm not sure about other countries. Um, this would kind of mean that the app was pushed out to users and also that somehow uh, the operating system forced it to be activated. That would begin to raise some significant privacy issues if that was the approach taken. A second approach is the government just getting access to location data that's already been collected by of mobile providers or by other services that track location. <clears throat> that could be Facebook or Google or others that, that look at location for advertising purposes. Um, and here the carriers or services might disclose the data voluntarily or be compelled uh, to do so. And that would be more centralized. The government would kind of be able to then see, you know, to do some testing and see who is infected and then they would already know um, who to notify. Um, the third is a, a kind of area surveillance where you set up some form of surveillance, whether it's Bluetooth or uh, phone-based or facial recognition at particular transit points where a lot of people pass by. And you can look for people who have, you know, been tested positive or were subject to quarantine and might be breaking it. Now, all of these applications then have to deal with complex questions around notification. So if you test positive, um, you know, who do you share that information with? Just the public health authorities? Is that mandatory or voluntary? Who do the health authorities share it with? Um, how, is it in, how is this information pushed out to users? Is the proximity determined um, only on the user's device, so locally, or is it determined at the server level? So whoever controls the server would understand uh, who's come into contact with infected people and could then act accordingly. Um, and then there's questions around sharing of this data with, with other, with third parties, with researchers, whether it's individual, whether it's aggregate. Aggregate. So there are a whole bunch of technical parameters that we could talk about, uh, privacy concerns as well. Um, but I want to just bring this to a close quickly by focusing on what's happened in the in the EU so far. So some uh, countries, notably uh, according to the press, Germany uh, and Belgium, have already begun using location data shared by phone carriers. Whether this complies with the GDPR, I don't really know at this point because I haven't seen enough details on that. Um, in early April, though, a group of privacy engineers and uh, policy uh, analysts in Europe published a position paper on what they call decentralized privacy preserving proximity tracing. So that kind of represents the high bar of what a privacy protective approach to contact tracing would look like. And then on April 15th, the eHealth Network, which is a group of uh, national public health officials in Europe, published what they called a, a toolbox setting out some basic requirements for contact tracing, uh, including that it be voluntary, that the applications be approved by national health authorities, that it be privacy preserving, although they really only talked about encryption in that context, uh, and also that it be short term, that it be dismantled when it was no longer needed. Um, 
And they also emphasize that this app should be able to handle cross-border interoperability because obviously it wouldn't suffice if it only worked in, in one country and didn't work as you uh, crossed borders into, into other parts of the EU region. So I think the questions this raises for the GDPR, the whole project underlying the GDPR is, you know, will the commission look to enforce the GDPR on these applications? Will it Will it kind of mandate a solution? Will local data protection officials uh, prohibit the use of certain tracking systems if they're inconsistent with these requirements? Um, and then finally, how will the commission uh, sort out the proposal that's now been put forward by Apple and Google um, to build some of this capability into their um, phone operating systems on an interoperable basis. Um, and interestingly, we can, we can talk more about this because none, none of these things are really settled yet. But interestingly, I would point out that the Apple Google proposal, notwithstanding the fact that it arises in the US without a comprehensive privacy law, it captures many of the same elements uh, as this uh, e-health uh, toolbox put forward in, in Europe. So that's, that's kind of the current state of things. But I think the, the, the key issue is how, in the name of the GDPR, European officials will balance the demands of successfully combating the virus on the one hand, but maintaining uh, privacy requirements on, on the other. And even kind of a, a question of governmental accountability and power, what will be the driving agencies behind this? Will, it, will, will the data protection officials really drive this forward or will it be the public health authorities in consultation with them, which could lead to different results? Thank you so much, Ira. Very um, interesting thoughts and important sort of input on the pressing questions related to data protection, privacy, and contact tracing. Sandra, I want to ask you, against the backdrop of your research, you've sort of outlined very precisely the limits of the GDPR, um, problematized um, inferences, but also outlined um, sort of possibilities. And I do wonder, could you speak uh, to what Ira said and sort of use, use your analysis and um, perhaps uh, let us participate in your thinking on, is this sort of an opportunity to uh, implement uh, the rules that you propose or the, the approaches that you propose? Or uh, what are the challenges against the backdrop given that potentially we are uh, collecting uh, data uh, on very sensitive topics through uh, contact tracing that could be used either by private or uh, public entities in the future? Yes, um, thank you. Um, yes, I, I think the question of data protection and non-discrimination and the protection of fundamental human rights are obviously extremely important when we think about this topic. I, I however, don't think that this is a second order question. I think those types of law are a question of implementing it in a safe way that hasn't really addressed the question whether we should do it in the first place. And I think that's something we need to have um, a discussion around because, and that's even true from a legal perspective, whenever you take a measure that is um, infringing or touching or limiting your human rights, you need to prove that this is in accordance with the proportionality test. And that means you need to show that the measure that you're choosing, contact tracing, is necessary and effective um, in order to um, achieve the public goal of public health. And that is something that the law cannot answer. This is something that epidemiologists have to answer. Those are the only people we actually should listen to because they have the expertise of understanding how outbreaks work, how they can be traced, um, how things can be mitigated. I think we need to get their knowledge and their understanding and compare that with their methods and see if we're actually adding something to the discussion by proposing that kind of stuff. So that's a first order question. Is it actually going to do the trick? Um, that's the first question. And then we have to think about, let's say it is, and then you know somebody, somebody that is an expert can tell me that this will actually help us. 
then we need to think about how we implement it. And that's the important question of how does GDPR non-discrimination law um, uh, relate to that? And I think a couple of things that I already mentioned, I, I completely um, agree. Um, one is definitely who gets access to it. Um, that's an important question. Um, I also see a, a threat, as you just mentioned, with just sharing the data with third parties, using it for purposes that have not been um, the purpose of what it was collected for. We have had that in the past many, many times that, you know, um, it was promised the data would be used for one purpose, but then it was used for something else. How can we make sure um, that doesn't happen? Um, how can we make sure that there is some sort of sunset clause? Because that's not how we want to remain, right? This is a, a, an intervention, a very privacy um, invasive intervention. When do we know that the crisis is over? What kind of mechanisms do we have in place to constantly check? Are we still in the state of emergency or are we okay, right? Somebody needs to do that. If we don't do that, we might forget what it felt like to be not surveilled. Um, and we just get used to the new normal um, and we'll just surrender our rights without, um, you know, uh, and, and forget about how, how it used to be. And the last thing I think I, I just briefly mentioned is that um, it's, I think it's, fantastic that all of our brains are constantly working like clockworks at the moment and we're working together to find solutions from so many disciplines like i'm overwhelmed by um the the human spirit of we are gonna get through this it, it really makes me um yeah uh, it gives me a lot of hope and strength to be honest the only thing i do worry about is that um if we have too many good proposals and that we end up with too many apps that this could also be a problem, right? I think that's one of the ideas or one of the, 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 the rare instances where a lot of competition is not the thing you're looking for, right? Um, where it could actually be harmful if you have 15 different apps. And again, hard to decide how we should govern through that, but those are just the, the thoughts that, that would pop to my mind. But I think um, by reiterating through those things together, I think we can come to a very good uh, solution that helps us to navigate for the pandemic without surrendering our uh, fundamental rights. Thank you for that. Uh, wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask one uh, more question as a uh, host, and then I'm going to um, turn over to uh, our viewers and the questions that we've been receiving from them. Um, and I want to return to um, uh, the issue of um, centering on procedural rights, specifically consent, and Sandra, you, you spoke about that, and, and Ira, you pointed to that also a little bit. Do you feel that while we're talking about um, contact tracing and mitigating the virus uh, through contact tracing, that we are perhaps focusing too much on the question of consent um, and sort of um, volunteer to uh, contribute our data to uh, to managing um, the, the spread of the virus at scale or not? And I'm gonna start with Ira, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that's probably the, the million dollar question here. Um, I think that Sandra is, is certainly right that the efficacy of testing has to be established first. Um, and that's partly a question of whether the tracing methods are granular enough to really establish, you know, contact, what the algorithm is like for, uh, you know, a, a positive contact rather than a fleeting one, um, or one that's irrelevant because someone's on the other side of a glass, you know, shield, but still shows up on, on your phone. Um, whether the population that's using this app is the population we really want to target, whether it's, you know, inclusive of homeless people, elderly people, people with older phones, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think all of that is necessary to establish sufficient trust so that ideally people, right thinking people would voluntarily use the app in sufficient numbers to make this work. I think that's the right way to think about this and to introduce this and that people can uh, at least see how that goes before turning to more mandatory approaches. And I think the, the reason that the voluntary approach is the right way to start is that there are so many other instances of uh, 
you know, responses to emergencies focusing on the use of intrusive surveillance that, that don't go away, that don't sunset, that don't have limited uses or purposes, that you know, unless we start with this privacy preserving approach, one aspect of which is that that it be voluntary, but there's, you know, there's there's ample reason <laughs> for people to to sign up to this, provided they have trust in it. Um, that unless we start there, the, the risks are, are, are extremely high. Now, that said, I think this will also be a very interesting, maybe quite, you know, unwanted and unpleasant, but still very interesting experiment in just how the personalities of different countries are reflected in the way that they roll this out. And, you know, it may be that, um, you know, in the US, there's just, there's sufficient understanding of privacy preserving approaches, even without something like the GDPR, to get this off the ground, to get it moving, to let kind of, you know, innovation and, and the market play a role. There may be other countries that are too bureaucratic, too heavy handed, um, who insist on testing everything and checking everything first. And it'll just be interesting to see how that plays out. Like what results from that? How does the experience compare? It's not a contest obviously, but I, I think the you know, some of the, the core aspects of different countries will be reflected in how they approach this. Yes, so I think mo most, like, I, I think I agree with everything that, that, that Ira said. Um, I, don't, I don't dare to say whether a consent-based or a mandatory basis is the way to go. I, I think, again, that that's, will depend on how effective and how promising that, that approach is. Um, I think the only thing I'd say that even if we did go with a consent model, um, what I would want to see is that we don't fall on the same pitfalls that we did previously with consent, right? In the sense that we write it in a way that is so hard to understand, um, pages and pages of legalese that nobody really reads and just consent to without understanding what's happening. Um, a lot of people might be under pressure to actually consent to that because maybe they wanna return to work and you don't wanna have a situation where they then have to sign away their rights basically. So I think even if you do, do go with consent, I think there has to be um, a minimum standard of unwaivable rights. So regardless of if you consent or not, certain things have to be guaranteed um, it can't be the same gutcha effect that we have with terms and conditions. Like, yeah, but you signed this. That must be fair. Um, that that can't happen for something important as health data, which means you know things like it has to be deleted once it's over, or it's not being shared with your insurance company, or sunset clauses, or whatever it might be. Regardless, there has to be a minimum standard or a, a high standard. I want to say um, for those apps, even if it's being done on a voluntary basis, because I, I don't want to have the, the same cookie better um, awfulness with, with something as important as health data. Um, Mona, if I could just very quickly respond to that last sure. point. Go I think, ahead. I think it's an excellent point and it emphasizes one clear advantage of the GDPR at this point, which is that those you know, what Sandra referred to as unwaivable rights, th those are already on the books. Th those, they're already there. Um, whereas in the US, um, if a contact tracing app was put out by uh, the leading uh, mobile vendors, or even a, there was a public health authority writing the app, but the means for establishing what your rights were was the usual, you know, download, click OK, check the terms of service, You'll, you'll have no foundation of rights absent new positive law. And that, that's a pretty heavy burden in a health emergency like this. So the fact that you already have an established law in the GDPR could turn out to be a, a significant advantage provided that it doesn't unduly impede uh, the you know, development and, and widespread use of, of such an app. Yeah, thank you so much both for these uh, for these insights. Um, against that backdrop, it's quite re 
interesting, um, Ira, what you just said, well, the, these rights are on the books. It's sort of interesting to just remark that within the GDPR, we do have exemptions for pandemics explicitly. For example, in Article 46, 52, 54, sort of a kind of uh, already making exemptions for, for these kinds of things. And so it's interesting and important to note um, that these come in tandem, obviously, with all, all the other uh, regulatory frameworks and rights um, that um, are in existence in the European um, Union. I want to turn over to our uh, viewers and um, their questions. Ira, uh, I have a question for you, um, which is how do the GDR provisions on automated decision systems apply to deep learning systems? And is it possible for most firms to comply using in-house capacity or do they typically need to turn to third-party explainability firms? Uh, I'm only guessing here, and, and if Sandra has more experience with particular firms, she should certainly jump in. But um, I think it really just varies with who has developed uh, the decision-making application. If it's, a, if it's a firm that's a sophisticated tech firm and it's developed its own application, I don't know that it needs to turn to a third party. If it's um, just a you know, a, a retail service firm or, or a hotel firm that acquires most of its IT from third parties, then it's likely to need to turn to a third party. I think the, the deeper issue though, is whether the emphasis on uh, explainability, uh, the underlying, you know, logic of the decisions is really the right emphasis, both in terms of how feasible it is, which is partly a computer science question, but also on whether it um, continues to stress the whole issue of, you know, individual privacy management, self-management, control by the end user. Um, and, and if so, then I think it may not be the right approach. Thank you. Um, Sandra, I have one for you. Article 9 protection of sensitive personal data, such as race, religion, etc., cetera, um, um, hasn't been raised much in court. Is that attributable to the primacy of the commercial consent model or is something else? Um, that's a fantastic question. Um, it is uh, one that I uh, address in in quite length in the um, in the right to reasonable inferences paper, just very quickly. I have also uh, flirted with the idea to try to use Article 9 um, GDPR um, to give us um, bigger protection because the interesting wording of, of that provision says that you get higher protection um, for sensitive data if the data is per se sensitive. So it says like you have a certain type of disease or if data is revealing something sensitive about you. So not directly, but indirectly. And that means inferences, you know, it's another word for inferences. So I got very excited about the idea and figured, okay, if you're inferring something sensitive about the person, maybe that's a type of inference that is personal data and is then being um, protected under the law. And I looked at what the court of justice thinks of that. And there was an interesting judgment where the court did actually address this. And um, the court said that the power from turning something that is normal personal data to turning into something that is sensitive data is reliant on two conditions. First of all, you need to have the intention to infer the sensitive attribute. And second of all, what you're inferring has to be reliable. And both of those things are very problematic when it comes to big data and AI because intent is not necessary for you to infer something sensitive, right? If you use a strong proxy for something, be the postcode, that information about, for example, ethnicity will be baked into the algorithm regardless if you um, have, if you want it or not. And the question of reliability, again, is not very helpful either because we are often working with predictions and opinions and um, things that happen in the future. So you cannot know whether it's reliable or not, right? So that could actually mean that you falling back to the normal protection and GDPR and sensitive inferences if they're not facts about a person might not be protected. So that's um, one of the things that I, uh, yeah, hoped that would give us a bit more protection, um, but it didn't. 
Um, yeah. Thank you very much for that. And that's particularly interested in the context of the pandemic, right? With what's going to happen with the data that we're collecting is what what is, you know, the what, interesting questions around intent and inferences certainly here, especially also as we think about um, and work on pandemic preparedness um, moving forward. Um, we do have more questions. Um, one very interesting one, um, at, at the base level, really, um, does or could uh, data minimization for big data lead to more bias in AI decisions? Ira, what do you think? I'm sorry, you said could data minimization accomplish what? Could that lead to more bias in AI decisions? I mean, th there has been um, a view developed to the effect that pre-big data, people relied on intuitive correlations that were often extremely you know, biased and, and inaccurate so that by relying instead on where the data takes you, you're um, overcoming some of, that, uh, some of that human bias. Um, I think that more broadly, there's just a, a, a tension between the longstanding European principle of data minimization and the very way in which you know big data analysis uh, occurs. Um, I, I mean, I, I suppose it's just a bit of a trade-off in the end, and that uh, the the best outcome would be to take some of the steps that you know Sandra described to build in ways to uh, assure fairness in the application of these algorithms rather than to somewhat arbitrarily limit or exclude the use of, of, of data types that, that could point to interesting results. Um, so thank maybe, maybe that's, that. that's too balanced to answer. But. No, thank um, you for that. Yeah, go, oh, go ahead. So, no, go ahead. I was going to ask you. All right. Um, yes, I think it's a very, very fair question. And one of the questions that also keeps keeps me up at night. I address it a little bit in the paper on why fairness cannot be automated, because I also see a very interesting tension between privacy lawyers and computer scientists. They are fighting for the same thing, which is, you know, fairness. Um, but the computer scientists say we need as much data as possible to figure out when something is biased and test for it. And all the protection lawyers are like, oh my God, you cannot collect sensitive data. Don't do it. Don't, don't collect what you can't protect. Um, so there is a definite tension in terms of dogma or logic or how we approach those things. Um, I think legally speaking, it's not something that will stand in the way because we have other principles that say like data minimization means you only so are only supposed to collect the data that is necessary and preventing discrimination is something you can say is necessary, which is not to say that you need to type all types of data and just to be sure we collect everything about you, everything that is intimate um, or sensitive, that's not the solution either. You have to make a good judgment call of what is the data that you actually need to test for that bias. And that needs then to be coupled with some type of accountability mechanism. Like I'm talking about like fairness testing, but also, um, yeah, talk about explainability. You need to explain, you know, why uh, why certain data had an Im impact on decision making. Um, for example, because I said I, I I don't think that the law actually gives us enough um, guidance on that. Unfortunately, Article 29 Working Party, for example, was very clear to say that there is no such thing um, as right to explanation, which is not to say that we shouldn't do it. Um, just because something is not legally required doesn't mean it's not ethically desired to do so. So just to come back to the question, yeah, can you can you do a cheap and easy version? Yes, you can. Should you do it? Probably not. Thank you very much. I have a question on the European digital economy, um, which is what about the impact of the GDPR and the regulatory interventions that Sandra proposes on the European digital economy? Um, folks have been writing about this, among them Kathy Stramberg. Um, what is your take? And this is for uh, both of you. I already want to start. Or Sandra, go ahead. 
I'll, I'll um, <laughs> so yes, it is. I, I think it's 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 always important to take um, economic perspectives also into account when, when thinking about regulation. I, I will not deny that. Um, I think the truth is probably somewhere in the middle there. As often as in politics, there is a very bipolar discussion going on. One say, oh my God, this is gonna make the economy crash. And the other say, oh my God, if we don't have that, we all we know human rights are basically useless or worthless. And I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. Um, I don't think the GDPR had or has or will have a negative effect on the economy. In fact, it's going to be the, the, the opposite. I think it's actually having a very good impact on the economy. So one argument is to say that if you look at what the data protection directive required you to do, um, it's basically the same thing that has been, that is in the GDPR. The only thing is that there have been new fines and some more, a couple of more rights, but I'd say 95% is the same thing. And we have had it for over 25 years and the economy has not collapsed. So that's to say, no, um, the regulatory framework is not um, uh, hindering the, the, the economy. The second thing is that I actually think it's helping there have been interesting studies that measure to, for example, the impact on GDPR on advertisement and the revenue has been the same and it didn't have a negative impact. However, what studies have found is that um, people started voting with their feet when they found out that the data has been used in an unethical way. So in transparent or without their consent and for different purposes, consumers actually change providers. So that means that you know ethical behavior um, can increase revenue if you do it right. And there have been studies that show if you are actually very transparent and fair about your data, customers come to you. So not only did it not ruin the economy because we have had it for 25 years, there's actual data that it did not only not harm the economy, it actually increased revenue um, because people value privacy and ethical behavior. Um, yeah, let me add a few thoughts to that. One, one is that innovation is often played as a trump card in the US that suggests that, you know, any level of regulation will severely impede uh, economic efficiency and uh, delivery of innovative products. Um, and I, I think that's clearly wrong. I think it's been shown that even, even weak regulation can be very uh, beneficial in the sense that it forces companies that haven't taken a careful enough look at how their data flows work to look at that more seriously and, and take steps that would uh, enhance consumer trust in ways that are beneficial to their bottom line. Um, so I, I think that kind of extreme view on one side is wrong. At the same time, in the days leading up to the GDPR and even thereafter, you could hear European officials uh, assert almost entirely on an ideological basis that the GDPR was was bound to have a positive effect because it was bound to increase you know trust and transparency in such a way that users would then flock to European services and desert guess what other countries' services and that that just hasn't happened. There's really little uh, evidence of that. Uh, I've even heard. European officials assert that the reason California companies are successful is because California has strong privacy laws. And that seems like very bad economics to me. So I, I kind of agree with Sandra. I think that um, it's possible to regulate without uh, you know, undermining innovation, but at the same time, it's always going to be a question of, of balance and of how uh, much the regulations truly accomplish as opposed to just creating you know regulatory bureaucratic barriers that don't that don't do much to to accomplish the underlying objectives thank you so much um last question from um the audience before i take back control um this is for both of you really briefly um if you could respond to the following question does differential privacy help us battle the problem of algorithmic bias and the risk of inference in data sets? Sandra, if you wanna, wanted to start. So differential privacy um, 
is something that helps for certain types of application. You know, it is a good tool if you want to learn something about a group. It allows you to query a database and figure out um, the attributes of a group without linking it back to an individual. That is fantastic and it's, it can be very helpful for certain types of applications. The problem with it still is though you can combine it with other data sets and find things out about those people and can still link it back. So it's not a failure of this of differential privacy. It's just something that you can still do something very problematic with it. Um, apart from that, like even if you don't know who in a group, who, who the people in a group are, you don't need to know that um, in order to potentially harm them or discriminate against them. So there's an interesting scholarship that has emerged over the last couple of years, which is called um, group privacy, which is based on the idea, also something that I talk about in my reasonable inferences paper, that um, you can learn something about people without using data that is about them or linking to them or identifies them um, in, any, in, any, in any way because the algorithms don't necessarily need that. Again, it's, it's based on the idea that it's a human is interested in another human, whereas an algorithm is not, the, that just doesn't, just doesn't work that way. Um, so even if you have the privacy protection, you still need to ask the question, what do you use the data for? And that's the interesting part. You know, what, what are you using the information that you have about that group? And that's an entirely um, different policy question that also differential privacy wouldn't be able to answer. Um, so yes, very good for for some some applications and enables research without linking to it. But linking to an individual is not necessarily the thing that will potentially hurt them in the future um, because you can hurt people without knowing knowing who they are. That makes sense. Uh, yeah, I concur with that answer. The only thing I'd have to add is that. Um, Differential privacy is not a magic bullet and it shouldn't be viewed as the only the only way forward so that it becomes the you know the, the paradigm for something that's privacy preserving and and any other approaches are then you know ruled out of course. It has it has you know enormous benefits, but it doesn't have universal application. So we still need other other solutions in other arenas and those may require uh, somewhat, somewhat different approaches with other policy assumptions underlying them. Thank you both for your um, for your uh, takes on differential privacy. A very important question, very timely question. Um, my last question for today, as we're wrapping up for both of you, is um, we have really. Um, taken a, a good look at the strengths and weaknesses of the GDPR. We have still a situation whereby uh, the GDPR is hailed as, as, as one of the most comprehensive and, and powerful data protection approaches. We have a particularly challenging situation in all kinds of ways or in all the ways uh, at the moment, but also for questions around um, data protection and privacy. Um, we also know that these are very complicated um, complicated discussions that we're having. Um, uh, we ha we're having discussions generally about uh, data protection, but particularly in the context of um, tackling the spread of the virus on a global level with the, all the different cultural backgrounds that come with that, the different sort of legal uh, 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 backgrounds that come with that. Um, we have different uh, literacies among different groups of professionals that participate in this conversation uh, or people who are absent from that conversation. In the United States, we are in an election year. So my question for both of you is, what do we as citizens need to know about issues around data protection? What kind of cues can we take from the GDPR? Um, and what do we need to push for moving forward? Ira, if you could start. Well, I mean, as I pointed out, it's been uh, 20 years since the Federal Trade Commission first recommended that Congress enact an online uh, privacy law. Uh, I guess one of my fears is that when Congress finally moves in that direction, it may be solving problems of the past rather than problems of the future. Uh, I think there's much to learn from the GDPR. Uh, we see it reflected in both 
uh, the recently enacted uh, California Consumer Privacy Act. Some of the ideas are showing up there and in proposals that in other states, including Washington state. Um, and it's also showing up in uh, various federal proposals. But at the same time, I, I'm not necessarily enamored of a omnibus law. Listening to uh, Sandra, one of the things that occurred to me is that the type of approach she's uh, aiming for is maybe better reflected in sectoral laws and that a law, kind of the original big data law, big data privacy law is the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which was enacted over 50 years ago um, and has a companion bill called the Equal Credit Opportunity Act that addresses discriminatory issues. Um, and that in the, you know, in the specific context of, of credit bureau data collection, it, it has its imperfections, but it does a reasonably good job of addressing many of the issues around fairness and reliability and permissible uses. And that a, a model that try to, tries to build similar laws, but looking at the specifics of different sectors uh, may be more successful. It could be more challenging to get many laws enacted, but some of the difficulties with the GDPR have to do just with its, you know, its generality and its complexity and its comprehensiveness. So possibly a, a sectoral model is, 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 is a viable alternative. Yes, I think I actually, um, yeah, I fully, fully agree with that. I think in my ideal scenario, uh, the European and the American approach would marry. Um, I think that would be um, probably the ideal outcome for me. I do like the GDPR approach that we have a baseline, a standard baseline that is untouchable, um, that regardless of who you are um, and what you use the data for, if you're collecting data, you have to have certain standards in place. And I think that's very good. Um, however, I also think that nuance is very important. Um, and having a sectoral approach, for example, employment, uh, for insurance, for credit, uh, research, um, for all of that, that allows a bit more of agility, um, either for higher protection or more relaxed protection could actually be very beneficial. So he gets like a building block of this is a minimum requirement that we need to follow. But then depending on the risks and the opportunity to arise from that, more nuance and flexibility. So ideally, I would think we we bring both um, those, those things together. I think that would be the best outcome. And I think for the future, I think the only thing that I would like to remind us of that, that we uh, take this opportunity to um, ponder and reflect why we do care about privacy in the first place. And don't forget that. Um, we always say general data protection regulation, data protection, data protection is actually about privacy. Data protection is just one aspect of privacy. We need to remember and keep remembering throughout the whole pandemic why privacy is so important. It's easy, as, as Ira said, to say, well, it's always like easy to trade it off with something else but we need to remember that. We need not to fall in the pitfall of if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear um, paradigm. And we need to think about why privacy is actually important for individuals. It's very important that you have you know, um, privacy to figure out who you are, to develop your own capabilities, develop your personality, change your personality, have a home that is sacred, that is not surveilled when you can retrieve, where you can have your own thoughts, have private conversations with people, discuss ideas that are, might not be ready to be shared with the, with the public. Um, collective interests need, need, need privacy protection. All of that is important and we must not forget that that we that we understand that privacy is essential for the proper functioning of democracy and we don't and we reclaim our rights as soon as the crisis is over what a fantastic closing remark thank you so much uh, and it is indeed time for thanks my biggest uh, thanks of course go to my terrific panelists today Sandra Wachter from uh, University of Oxford and Ira Rubinstein uh, also at NYU, uh, but today in Seattle. Thank you so much for your contributions. This was a fantastic conversation. Um, and I do hope that it will uh, travel into classrooms, into meeting rooms uh, and, and beyond. 
Um, I also really want to thank my, IT, my team at IPK for helping putting this together and running the tech behind it in a fantastic way. The 370J project and their team, uh, the NYU Department of uh, Technology Conscious Society at Tandon, where I'm based, and also for today, the NYU Information Law Institute and NYU Law Gorini Global Law and Tech who have helped connect everybody and put this together. Thank you so much. Um, I hope this was insightful for everybody who participated. I do hope to see you again on the 14th of May for the uh, last co-opting AI in the season, which will be on gender. Uh, please stay tuned. This uh, conversation will be made available on the YouTube channel of the Institute for Public Knowledge, where it's currently also being streamed. And on that note, thank you everybody um, for your time. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you soon. And with that, I'm saying goodbye to our audience and our viewers uh, at home.